Hello everyone, welcome. Welcome to the 13th and final episode of my Introduction to Cybersecurity class at Tufts. I'm Ming Chao, Associate Teaching Professor at the Department of Computer Science. We made it, we've done it. 13 episodes, as I promised throughout this year. We did it, we did it this semester. Today, as the 13th and final episode, I promise that it will be a very sobering one, and for a very good reason. And then we'll return next year in 2021. Because I've thoroughly enjoyed this format and stream uh, throughout this last 13, 14 weeks, we're going to do an encore performance. We're going to continue, we're going to do this again, starting in February 2021. So we're going to do an encore performance starting 2021, and I'll see you back then. But for now, let's end this class with fireworks. Here we go. All right. So far throughout this whole course, we've learned a little bit about a lot. We've learned networking, basic networks, cryptography, vulnerabilities, static and dynamic analysis, web security, malware, and we even did some forensics as well. But now it's time to talk about the hard problems in cybersecurity. Maybe I'll just leave this here. I'm not going to say a word. Four pictures. So what are each and every one of these four pictures for? The four pictures, the whole purpose is to illustrate the really sad state of cybersecurity. On the top left, it was a picture of the top U.S undergrad computer science program skip cybersecurity classes. On the top right, the hard-coded passwords that were in Mirai, the IoT botnet. Bottom left, SQL injection on uh, VTech. And last but not least, bottom right corner, Yahoo says uh, it was a Yahoo hack. Okay? And it is also important to note that each and every one of these incidents happened before, and all these news articles happened before 2017. This report was written by uh, a friend. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Josh Abraham. Um, when he was at, formerly when he was at Praetorian Cybersecurity, uh, he did a report on... Um, all the findings, uh, 100 separate internal penetration te testing engagements and their findings. And at the very top, if you take a look at their top five findings, one, two, three of them had to do, uh, and actually, I'm sorry, uh, four uh, attacks had to do with weak passwords. A little bit more. These tweets were from 2016 by Ken White and Steve Christie Coley uh, regarding uh, German telecom routers knocked off online thanks to a textbook operating system command injection attack. And here's a key point that Steve wrote is subject of every OWAP top 10 CWE top 25 list dating back to 2007. This is from Veracode Software Security, State of Software Security Report in 2016. The top 10 vulnerabilities categories overall. Percentage of application passing the OWASP top 10 policy and percentage of, oh, uh, percentage of application passing the CWE SANS top 25 policy. 
And if you take a look at this, at the percentage of application passing OAuth Top 10 policy, the majority did not pass. So what's the message here? The message is this. The most common attacks and security issues are the most difficult to solve. Phishing and social engineering, SQL injection, password reuse, DDoS, application, writing secure code, and of course, last but not least, policy. Here's a slide from Matt Blaze and Sandy Clark at the 11th, from the 11th Hope Conference in New York City, is where do we screw up? We sometimes screw up in algorithms and protocols. We often screw up in engineering and implementation, but we always, you almost, you can take out the word almost always, but you practically almost always fail in systems and applications. Um, and one of their concluding slides was, yeah, we're in a national cybersecurity crisis. Um, we only got really two good options to take away backdoor, which is crypto and simplicity. Keep this in mind. So what's, what's the point here is we're still battling the same vulnerabilities that we've known for decades. Even further, we're still arguing about the same stuff that we've known for decades. Remember the clipper chip and the crypto wars? Nah, that's still going on. We still can't even get the basics right. Okay, you still get people using weak passwords. You still have people using stir copy. Maybe this is a time for everyone to start think hard about the basic issues. And one of the first, and one of the things I teach in my security class is, um, at the very beginning, it's, it's the Trinity of Trouble, which was coined by Gary McGraw. And as we stand right now, things are going growing in complexity, which is the enemy of security. whole bunch of references. You may think this is the last slide. I really could end my talk here. Actually, that's that. That is. That's the end of my slides. I had a very deeper one. I had a much deeper presentation slide that I could go to. Hang on. Okay. I literally could have ended my talk there. <laughs> I really, really could have just ended my talk here. So, I would have been doing a complete disservice if I just ended my talk there. If I just ended today with the list of references. But what do we really, really need to do moving forward? Well, we got to be more boring. We got to talk and inform those who are curious. Some things that I've gotten by Ed Felton and Gary McGraw in 2004. Build relationships with those, especially those in policy or in government. To invest in training and mentors and developers. Because we actually have it's becoming crystal clear that many, many developers don't even know an ounce of security. 
And maybe we should actually send a message back to the younger generation, especially K-12 and undergraduates, because there's a huge hunger in this whole topic area. This was in 2017, written by Joe Urchill, Fundamental Flaw in, in WannaCry. But yeah, you go to Black Hat, you see a lot of novel attacks, but most attacks are well-worn techniques like phishings and other for forms of fraud and security vulnerabilities that have long since been patched. Hmm. Is it too late? This is from Bruce Potter. Um, yeah, uh, there, you know, there was, in government, there was a bill on the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act, you know, to make sure that I Internet of Things stuff is patchable and have no hard code password, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Bruce mentions, he said, legislation is a heavy hand and it will hurt. And this is how we have all failed and now paid a price. And here is another way to end. Okay. So, this really is the end of the slide. But what if I told you, what if I told you that this slide deck that I just presented was from 2017? I did this entire presentation slide, this entire set of presentation slides. I missed this one. But everything that we just we just did, I did this all in 2017 without any modifications and changes. Again, I repeat, the slide deck that you have we just ran that I just ran through, I did this presentation in 2017. I'm doing it here three years later, a little bit over three years later, and no changes whatsoever. And I didn't need even need to make any changes at all. And it still holds, which is a really sad part of right now. I did not even make a change to this presentation slide. I just ran it as is. Even the email and Twitter handle still stays the same. Oh, I didn't show this one. Want to give out a shout out to Russell. Mr. Bright Shiny Objects. Yeah, there's a lot of infatuation with machine learning, AI, and ML. And of course, I showed you this earlier. But what's amazing is, you know, if you take a look at everything that has happened over the last three years, um, you know, I could, we could add even more to this whole arsenal of incidents. I didn't even, you know, what has happened over the last three years? Equifax. And hell, look no further than a few days ago with the FireEye incident. What's happening? What's happening is, look, there has been no changes since, the whole point is there hasn't been any changes since I last gave this presentation in 2017. The incidents and hacks have gotten even greater. We're still stuck and then we're still actually stuck with the base. And then the basics we still can't even get right. That's the whole point. The hard problems in cybersecurity, yeah, they're still going as we speak. Still going. Weak passwords. How do your expensive security product do? Well, the last time I checked, that antivirus didn't stop any of the recent incidents. I have not taken a look at the latest severe code state of, state of software security. 
but I'm sure that very few has changed. SQL injection, still a big deal. Like these are right now the real hard problems in cybersecurity. You can learn all the tech in the world, but do they actually, so you can learn all the tech in the world, but do they solve these problems? I don't know. If there's anything good that has happened over the last three years, yeah, I mean, the uh, attention to cybersecurity issues have gotten a little bit greater. I mean, there's that, there's that. That there's more talk about, you know, attacks, incidents. But I'll say this is I can probably, I'll bet my money that I can give the same exact presentation as in, in three years. No changes at all. And it will still hold true. I'll bet my money on that. And with that, mic drop. So with some time, I'll take any questions. Anyone? Any questions on Twitch? Yeah, nothing. Back doors, any solutions? Well, There is. I can think of one. So in context, for backdoors, you know they're still, um, this is still an ongoing issue. I think there was a, I think there was an email provider that actually is now putting a backdoor. I think it's not somewhere in Europe. I have to look at it. I just read about it a few days ago. So there are email providers and law enforcement want backdoors into everything. So, okay. If that's the case, if, if, let's say for the sake of argument that there's a backdoor in everything, all the technology that you, we use, say that for the sake of argument, then how do you trust anything that, how, how can you trust any, any technological device? So what I'm trying to say is this, the solution is maybe less is more. Maybe a draconian solution is, well, to start to move away from, if, if we go to, if we get, if we go to a point where every technology, every piece of technology is backdoored. And of course, that also erodes any trust that you will have with your tech, de with your with your te tech de tech devices. Maybe the best option is to walk away. It's a draconian one, but that's the a one solution that comes to mind immediately. It's a draconian one, and we may actually have to do that if that is the road ahead. If that everything gets backdoored, and why and how in the world can we actually trust? those uh, those devices that are back to it that's the thing that comes to my head you say okay here's another question you say that you think the pre okay uh, you think the presentation will be the same in three years do you think the consequences and attacks will increase with this um as in as in both the security and attacks are going to increase at similar rates I have a very good feeling that the answer is yes, absolutely. I think that the consequences and attacks will increase in the next three years. Um, 
we are still at a point in our lives where everything is so technology dependent. And even worse, I think, and the writing is on the wall right now, is we're in a pandemic and COVID expedi expediated a lot of things. COVID expediated a lot of things, including uh, infrastructure and working at home. So if over the last year, there is a big push to work at home, um, and of course, that also means putting more strain and more emphasis on our current internet architecture. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's, that's right now, that's going to be the target. You are actually seeing this in a little bit, in, even in things like in education, in K-12 education, uh, remote education. Uh, how many school systems have been knocked off either by way of DDoS or ransomware? So, yeah, as we are now in a pandemic, and this is, there's no sign of this ending anytime soon, yeah, there's going to be an increase in security and attacks. Ah, here's a good one. Do you think there should be more legislation surrounding cybersecurity and data than there uh, actually currently is? If so, can you, could you elaborate on that? Okay. So one thing since, oh, so again, I did this presentation in 2017. I did this presentation in 2017. Has there been any major legislation surrounding cybersecurity and data then, uh, uh, since then? And yeah, the answer is yes. One thing that has been a big matter over the last three years has been GDPR in Europe, which is the, oh, I always forget the acronym of GDPR, which is, I'm out. Uh, which is the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe. Um, has that worked and has that not worked? And the answer is both. Uh, I think you're seeing a lot of good that comes out of GDPR. It's aggressive. Uh, it gives uh, people the right to be forgotten. Okay. But at the same time, GDPR has also made uh, another issue, uh, a negative effect of GDPR is, um, you know, one, of course, I can think of immediately is the usability of the technology and things like websites. I mean, you can't go to a website these days without seeing, you know, a big note that says, oh, this website uses cookies. So you have a usability issue there. Okay, um, so that's been an adverse effect. So more legislation surrounding cybersecurity and data, you're going to start to see more of that. Um, you're, you're seeing the writings on the wall perhaps right now. Um, this may be a little bit of a tangent, a little bit, but it sheds light on where things are going. You are seeing, uh, you are seeing the government having lawsuits against like the big tech, whether it's monopoly and certainly with the data, uh, 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 with, with monopoly, does it have to do with anything with security and privacy? Well, yeah, perhaps, because of course there's an underlying issue of data here. So yeah, there's going to be more legislation, uh, and more, um, involvement from the government, whether it's federal, whether it's international. Now, you didn't say whether it's international legislation or, or, or which level of government. There's going to be more. What's the impact of it going to be? I think you're going to see both good and bad. Okay. Okay. Do you think it's effective for cyber insurance company to use prices to incentivize good security? Okay. I'm glad that you, this is a good question. I have a former student that actually wrote um, an article for 2600 Magazine. I'm still waiting for when it's going to be coming out. So here's the issue of cyber insurance companies 
to incentivize good security. I'm starting to see a lot of the complete opposite. I'm seeing the complete opposite right now. Uh, I have seen, I've seen companies where, oh, they've invested in cyber insurance. Oh, we were insured. Uh, so that means we don't have to care about security. If we get hacked, oh yeah, we got to pay out. So I have actually, and so to make a long story short, I've seen cyber insurance companies, um, I've actually seen companies use cyber insurance to actually be even less proactive and care less about security. And it also get even more mixed up as well too. Now this gets mixed up. I think this happened with this has happened with uh, a few incidents in WannaCry in that companies got hit, they have cyber insurance, but then when they actually tried to cash out, they couldn't. So, but does that really answer your question? If a cyber insurance company to use prices to incentivize good security, um, prices in which way? Are we talking about prices of like how much you get paid for? Uh, getting ha attacked in, uh, in which in a certain type of incident. I think there is also a case to be made. Let's say, for example, a cyber insurance uh, company say um, a price of, okay, we'll only pay out $100,000 if you get hit by DDoS. So maybe, let's say, for example, if it's a small shop, it's like, oh my God, I can get paid out $100,000 if I get hit by DDoS. So that's a lot of money for a small shop. So maybe maybe I just want to uh, have an insurance fraud and where I actually do want to get, get hit by DDoS, then I collect $100,000. But at the same time, proving it is also going to be extremely difficult. So the answer to your question is, I highly doubt it. I'm not sure if prices are going to be, it can be used effectively to incentivize good security. Maybe I'm trying to say prices can probably be used to de-incentivize good security. I think the next time around I should do a follow-up presentation of this. And again, very few will change. Any other questions, thoughts? Ah, here's a good one. With what just happened to FireEye? Ah, here's a good question. With what just happened to FireEye, it is a perfect illustration of today's topic. Isn't it pretty disheartening that even a well-respected security vendor cannot protect their own network? And the answer is, So, let me take a step back for a second. With what just happened to FireEye, it is a perfect illustration of today's topic. Isn't it pretty disheartening that even a well-respected cybersecurity vendor cannot protect its own, own network? It was on Tuesday, last Tuesday, we got the news of FireEye. And... Coincidentally, how I got the news was from a student. I got a I got the news from a student in the class about what happened to FireEye. So my immediate reaction was twofold. On one hand, it was an eye opener. It was an eye opener because I know we know of FireEye's reputation. We know of and I also know of many good folks that work there, including former students that work at FireEye. So it was, it was sad. It was also felt we, I, I, I felt sick to my, I felt sick. I was like, this, this, this is, you know, it's like what? Really? So it was a mixture of surprise sadness but also at the same time it wasn't surprising as well too because again i tell people it's not a matter of if you'll get uh, if you'll get attacked but it's a matter of when 
So it was a mixture of, you know, oh shit, to not do it again. How are the rest of us supposed to protect our networks? It's even a more important question now, even um, even now, especially when we're all working from home. And so, is it more important to protect our network and say, oh yeah, absolutely. How to protect your own network at home? I mean, at the very lowest level, and I think about this often, is don't put all your eggs into one basket. Uh, I'll just give you an idea. If you're only using one kind of environment to do all your work, an example is going to be Google. Um, maybe the best thing is, you know, you want to spread out your risk. Don't put, don't mix all your business and your work stuff in Google and using Gmail. That's number one. Number two, um, number two, two-factor authentication works, especially when it comes to a good hardware key. And number three, you know, in terms of the basic network, 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 you know, don't make sure that, um, make sure that, you know, your home IP isn't accessible to the whole world. I mean, that's, that's the big one. You know, make sure that you don't have your home IP exposed to the, uh, your home network and infrastructure, unless you really have to, don't expose it to the whole world. Um, I set up a showdown rule just to, to show like if there's anything that's ever found in my home network, okay, that's a huge alert. That shouldn't be happening. Uh, there's another thing as well too about how to protect your home network. One of the things that I now use on my Mac now, kind of funny because I stopped doing this a long time ago, is I finally went back to it, is I'm using things like Little Snitch or Lulu, a firewall to see all your inbound and out. Like, you know, if it's trying, if your machine, if any app is trying to access uh, the internet outside communication, inbound or outbound, um, namely outbound, uh, it gives a warning. So that's what I use now. Uh, so to protect your network, I said four things. One, you know, spread out your risk. Like, don't put all your eggs into one basket. Number two, you know, two-factor authentication. Three, you know, don't have to, you know, unless you have to open up your home IP for the whole world, you don't need to. And number four, um, yeah, I use a firewall now to see what's going in and out of my machine. So that's for Boussard Collector. That's a great set of questions. Yeah, I have to say it's disheartening. If there's also anything else, um, um, uh, because you mentioned FireEye, something that you brought to my, it's something that I think a lot about now, is that what happened to FireEye is not just a technical issue. It's also a global slash international matter. If all that you have is a computer science degree, I don't think it's good enough. It's not good enough to understand what really happened uh, with FireEye. So it's a good tale that if you're going to do cybersecurity, or if you're going to understand instances like what happened to FireEye, you need to know a lot more than just, you know, programming, 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 theory, theory, theory. You have to know things about security. You have to know things about uh, geo uh, geopolitical risk. You have to know about things like international conflict. You have to know things like political science and international relations. Just knowing computer science is not enough. Anyone else? So, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, I'm going to close this one. I'm going to close this. But, we will return in 2021. I thought this was a one shot deal. 
I thought this was a one semester deal where I streamed to Twitch and YouTube. Um, I just can't thank you and the audience enough uh, for all the support, for all the wonderful questions. Um, can't thank you enough for it. I've reached a point where I've enjoyed this so much. And I've also invested so much in this that now I just can't stop. But now uh, that I want to come back and do this again, uh, perhaps as an encore presentation uh, in 2021. Now, this has been fantastic. I, I hope you've enjoyed uh, these live sessions on, on Thursdays as much as I have. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And I really want to come back in 2021 and do this. Happy holidays to everyone.